Today we're talking about more variations of, of the SAT problem, in particular 2SAT and max 2SAT. So let me let me warm you up a little bit because I, I know you've been studying everything except for this for the past week. So uh, we were talking about uh, these sort of very uh, logical problems where uh, uh, your input some kind of Boolean formula, you know, takes some bits and outputs true or false. And you want to figure out if there's some configuration of input bits to force it to output true. Okay. And, uh, you know, at some level, this is a search problem in the, in the abstract sense of the word where you're looking for something that you can recognize when you find it. Okay. So you're looking for some satisfying assignment. And the feature is that if you do have a satisfying assignment, it's very easy for a computer to double check it's correct. The computer just kind of parses it, plugs it in. You can imagine writing a, a relatively straightforward program to evaluate a Boolean function. Uh, but as far as search problems go, it seems much harder than over under. The over under game, there's like a clear structure. So I go up or down, right? And there's a structure we can take advantage of. We can have input size n and find this thing in time log n, right? And here is like somehow the opposite. Uh, we don't necessarily know how to navigate a Boolean formula very efficiently, right? Now, there, it is true that there's two to the n possible inputs and you're trying to find a Nego on a haystack. But if you can take the logarithm of this, then you get, you know, a polynomial time algorithm. In the binary search, we're able to take, oh, there's n possible locations and I output it in log n time, right? So somehow there's this difference that we can't quite articulate between uh, the binary search situation and the satisfying formula situation. But if you could, it would be great. Okay. And uh, yeah, so Boolean algebra is very expressive. And in fact, yeah, so that big question is, can we get an algorithm for this? That would be great because then I can just ask it questions and it would answer correctly. It's actually kind of similar to ChatGPT, except it wouldn't hallucinate. And, uh, right. And so besides Boolean formulas in general, you can look at more restrictive things like what's called conjunctive normal form. So that's when the formula has been turned into or is presented as an and of ors. Which, for example, if you drew out the tree, would always be some kind of like very flat tree. And so, oh, is that, is that simple enough? Is, maybe that will let, unlock the key to something as fast as binary search. Um, but uh, but it seems like uh, what we showed, instead of coming up with an algorithm, is we showed that we can take a generic Boolean formula and turn it into this conjunctive normal form without greatly increasing the input size, roughly keeping the same input size. So if you did have an algorithm for CNFSAT, you would have an algorithm for Boolean SAT. Right, so this is like very funny because this construction was an algorithm, uh, you know, where we the trick was this assignment trick where I kind of can gradually break up the tree into small clauses, right? Um, and so, so that was a mechanical procedure. I could write a program to to take a formula and turn it into a CNF SAT. It wouldn't be too bad, uh, and then <laughs> only to show. That means it's unlikely for us to find an algorithm for the actual problem we want, right? It's some kind of weird anti-algorithm algorithm. But still, this is a very practical form of thinking um, because at some level, it's an algorithmic problem and some amount of a conclusion, right? We're able to make some comment on a problem that we don't even know how to solve, which is actually pretty interesting. So we'll also looked at the same, even more special case of three sat. Now it's conjunctive normal form with three variables per clause, and we came up with the same conclusion. In fact, our original construction going from, from Boolean to CNF sat was already a three sat. So three doesn't do it either. Three is also just as hard, even though you might think, oh, isn't this simpler? Okay. The last example was circuit sat. Um, and there, that's a more generic case than Boolean sat because this is really a DAG instead of just a tree. A tree is a special case of a DAG structure, but indeed was roughly the, the assignment trick uh, 
you can show that circuit sat is equivalent as far as getting a polynomial time algorithm goes to Boolean sat. So, okay, so um, good. So where we left off was this predicament. So there's all these kind of natural problems involving these Boolean formulas or special cases thereof that we would like to have algorithms for. We couldn't come up with algorithms for them, but we did something interesting because we showed that they're equivalent as far as polynomial time running times go. If you just want any polynomial time algorithm, an algorithm for one is an algorithm for all. Okay, so it's an interesting style of thinking, maybe a new style of thinking, so it'll take a little while uh, for us to think about it. Okay, so yeah. So I'm saying that, let's take three sat. This seems like the easiest, this would be the easiest because the most structured. If you had an algorithm that could solve three sat, okay, what we did in class was we gave an algorithm that took any Boolean formula, okay, it takes as input any Boolean formula and outputs a three sat formula of roughly the same size, okay. So if you had an algorithm who, that can do 3SAT uh, while maintaining uh, satisfiability, so the 3SAT formula is satisfiable if, and only if the only original one is satisfiable. So if you had an algorithm to solve 3SAT, then I can give you an algorithm to solve Boolean formulas, any Boolean formula, by taking the Boolean formula, turning it into a 3SAT, and then using your algorithm for 3SAT. And so that what that shows you is that from a algorithmic perspective, getting a polynomial time algorithm for either of these is now equivalent. One direction was obvious. Of course, Boolean sat, Boolean formulas are more general than three sat. The other direction is not so obvious. Yeah. Sometimes this is called a reduction. Okay, and we've been already practicing them in uh, in disguise with those shortest path problems and things like that, right? I give you a complicated word problem. Okay, I don't know, uh, American path or something, or American walk. And then you show, oh, this is actually just a, this can be turned into a generic shortest path problem, uh, right? It's not actually harder than shortest path. I just had to figure out how to look at it differently. Okay, so it's actually very much same style of thinking, although this might feel more like a negative result, whereas last time it was like, oh, we can do it. And this time it's more like, oh, we can't do it. Okay. All right, so, so today we'll look at an even specialer case. So now I'm gonna give you a formula with exactly two variables per clause. And the question is, is there a polynomial time algorithm when there's only two variables? Last time we did three, we showed probably not, unless there's one for a Boolean. Now we're gonna bring it down to two. Okay, that's one of two problems we'll look at. The other problem seems awfully similar. It's called max two sat. So it's like two sat, except the goal is to satisfy as many clauses as possible. Okay. So you don't have to satisfy all of them necessarily. You're not asking if you can satisfy all of them. Your goal is just to satisfy as many of them as possible. And then we can ask the same question. Is there a polynomial time algorithm to satisfy as many as possible of a two sat formula? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you don't know anything. I just give you a two-step formula, and I say, can you find an assignment that satisfies as many as possible, whether or not it's possible to satisfy all of them? Yeah, so there's, you just kind of forget the intersect, the conjunctions between them. I just give you a bunch of ors and say, how many of these can you satisfy simultaneously? So it's an optimization problem as opposed to a yes-no question. I could turn into a yes-no by saying, is it possible to satisfy 
10 of these, 100 of these, 200 of these. And then I can binary search for the biggest number where the answer is yes. And that wouldn't be so bad. So it's, it's, it is sort of a yes, no question as well, but yeah. Okay, so here I force participation. So we're gonna take a vote, okay? So you have three choices. Uh, okay, so for each of these problems, uh, you can say, I think there's gonna be an algorithm, or I think it's gonna turn out to be as hard as that in the sense that if we came up with an algorithm, we'd have an algorithm for any Boolean formula. That was like the conclusion for three sat, okay? Or you're not going to vote. Okay. And I'm assuming that if you don't vote for one, you don't vote for the other. Okay. All right, so first of all, who's not voting? Okay, number grows every time. All right, good. All right, so let's start with two sat. Who thinks there will be a polynomial time algorithm? Okay. And who thinks it's going to turn out to be hard, just like 3SAT? All right, and now let's look at max 2SAT. Who thinks we'll get a polynomial time algorithm? Okay. And who thinks it's going to turn out to be hard, like 3SAT? Okay. Oh, that almost adds up correctly, 17 and 16. Good job. Okay, that said, there's still at least six of you who lied. Okay. Um, okay, good, good. Now, uh, so there's a, there's a general feeling that this problem should be kind of easier than this one. Or at least very few people seem to think that, well, I don't know if anybody thought that this one would turn out to be easy and this one would turn out to be hard since that's the minority. So, so several people must have thought that we can get algorithms. So what, why, why anyone who, who did vote this way, did you think that this problem might be easier than this one in some sense that I could get an algorithm for this, but not that? Yeah. Oh yeah, so, so it feels like less strict. Oh, this is just do as well as you can. And this is saying, uh, you know, you have to be perfect, right? Like imagine I walked into a midterm, like you would prefer one scenario over the other, <laughs> perfect or do the best you can, right? Um, okay, anyone else? Was that everyone else's reasoning? Okay, now, okay. So I have a question. If you had an algorithm for 2SAT, let's say that it was in this category, would that give you an algorithm for max 2SAT? Okay, what would be the algorithm? So you start with a formula and you want to satisfy as many clauses as possible. You have a black box that can satisfy a formula. Yeah. Okay, I confuse the black box and say if it's satisfiable, then it'll, I'll say yes, the answer is 100% and here's how you satisfy 100%. But what if the answer is not 100%? You can try picking out subsets or something, so I'm going to remove a clause. Which clause are you going to remove? It's a bit tricky, it seems. Okay, you could try removing a clause. Like, it's not say it's not possible to satisfy all of them. I try to remove all the clause and say, oh, can you satisfy this? But then I have to make sure I kind of remove the right clause. Yeah. Okay, can I do some waiting? Maybe that's kind of equivalent to, maybe I can duplicate clauses. That's like, if I just duplicate and that's worth twice as much. 
sort of within this framework uh, and, and not worry too much about duplicating tons, it's still not clear to me. I mean, if you duplicated a clause, you still wouldn't be able to satisfy all of them. Now, let me ask the converse. Suppose you had an algorithm for max two sat. Could that use, so you're trying to satisfy as many clauses possible. Could that give you an algorithm for two sat? Okay, so what would I do? I give you a formula, I want to know if it's satisfiable. Yeah, you see how many you can satisfy, and if it turns out to be all of them, then the answer is yes. Turns out to be no, less than all of them, the answer is no. So this problem actually shouldn't be harder than this one. Because an algorithm for this should give you an algorithm for this. The opposite direction is murky at best. Right? We haven't made progress in that yet. So there's no wrong answer when you do a poll. But like this was kind of a wrong answer. <laughs> like it should at least maybe be the opposite direction in the sense that that um you know this actually implies an algorithm for this. So this number probably shouldn't be higher than this. Okay. Uh, but you're still better than dishonest people. Okay. All right. So so let's look at two sat first. So here's two different formulas. Uh, the first one I I gave last time, which was a while ago, uh, which is not satisfiable because it has every combination of x1 and x2. So you can't make everything happy. Here's a second formula. What would be a satisfying assignment for this formula? Or maybe there isn't one. The second formula. Uh, X1 is what? False. And X2 is true. Um, does that work? I think that works. That one's okay. That one's okay. That one's okay. Okay, there's a satisfying assignment. Okay, so, you know, what's the difference? And how can I make an algorithm to figure this thing out? So there will be an algorithm. But uh, any ideas for even how to come up with an algorithm? Because, of course, once I reveal the algorithm, it's no fun. Yeah. OK, can I, can I take a, a formula and uh, somehow divide it up? Yeah, just scribbling here. Um, okay, so those dots are supposed to be, uh, they look like faces, but they're supposed to be some kind of variables. Okay, can I do some kind of divide and conquer where I split the formula in half and I say, okay, if this is satisfiable and that is satisfiable, then return true. Okay. Uh, that won't necessarily work, but what's the catch? Yeah. Yeah, you need the same as satisfying assignment for both. So if you just split them up, then yeah, so you're excluding this middle conjunction. So divide and conquer is tricky. Yeah. Any other fun ideas? Well, maybe let's walk through our thought process. So here's one that we know is not satisfiable. Okay. And and so let's let's walk through kind of like slowly and mechanically how you might go about it. So one option is like, well, what if I said x1 to be true? Right? So what if I said x1 to be true? Okay. 
what does what are my remaining options for x2? Well, okay, let's take this first clause, not x1 or x2. To satisfy that clause, what does x2 have to be? True. X2 has to be true to make that clause happy. Now look, let's look at this clause, not x1 or not x2. What does x2 have to be? Has to be false, right? So I kind of know if I go down this x1 branch, uh, uh, I'll reach some contradiction. X2 has to be both true and false. Okay, we're done. And we can do the same thing on the false side, right? Okay, what if x1 is false? Well, let's look at these two clauses. Okay, well, there's one. Uh, the first clause says, okay, x2 has to be true. That's the only way to satisfy that clause. And the other cl clause says x2 has to be false. Okay, right? So somehow, like, these clauses seem to, like, force stuff, right? Because there's only two choices in a clause. So as soon as x1 is false, I kind of know what x2 has to be. In this case, there's a contradiction, right? That's not necessarily true of like three sat, where there's even if you remove one variable, there's two other ways to satisfy. There's still choices. But here things suddenly become much more forced. Okay, so maybe we can try to, to leverage this. Okay, so we're gonna create actually a sort of graph to model some of these forcing relationships. Maybe before I reveal it, does anyone want to suggest how to make model this with a graph? Just for fun. Okay, so if you're making it a graph, do your do your vertices look like clauses? Do they look like subsets of clauses? They look like clauses. Okay, so then I have an edge from one clause to another. Like this would kind of be one vertex and there's an edge, I guess to another vertex, which would correspond to a clause. So does that mean each vertex looks like a subset of clauses? It maps to a set? If I had something like this, then I would, okay, so then, well, okay, so this is, this, are you describing sort of like this tree representation that, from before? Okay, but that, well, that is a graphical representation, that is true. Um, uh, but, it, well, it doesn't really change the information much. It's just like, I feel like it's just giving a, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let's try that. So I'm going to have a vertex for each literal. So, so the vertex corresponding to xi will be like I'm setting xi to be true. And the vertex corresponding to xi bar sort of means I'm setting xi to be false. So it's making the literal true, which is for the bar, sometimes the opposite. And so for every clause from uh, A, like of the form A or B, where A is maybe a literal, so this could be Xi or Xi naught, okay? Now I wanna make an edge modeling these implications. 
right? So what implications does the clause A or B give? Think of A and B as literals. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you're saying that if I set A to be true, that implies B to be true? Oh, I think it's, if A is false, then B has to be true. So somehow like not A should be imply B. And also if B is false, then A has to be true. So the opposite of B should imply A. So that means if, if A was like XI not, that would be, Xi implies whatever, yeah. So, okay, so we have these, I have some examples coming up carefully drawn, but saying, look, whatever this literal is, whether it's an Xi or Xi bar, if it's false, which is to say the opposite is true, then I have to make B true to get all the clauses. And then here's the opposite. Okay, so, okay, so I drew out this one. Uh, for the impossible one, so like x1 or x2, right? This is saying that if x1 is false, then x2 has to be true. So there should be an edge from x1 false to x2. And this clause is also saying is that if you set x2 to be false, then x1 has to be true. So I have an edge from x2 bar representing I set x2 to false, and it says x1 has to be true. And I did that for all four, and that's why we have eight edges. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not, I guess. The end is not explicitly written down anywhere. Uh, I'm just saying, that, well, it's sort of implicit in the background, right? Because this is saying that if I want to satisfy everything, you know, I'm trying to satisfy everything and stuff. Yeah, so it's not explicitly there, but I think maybe if we zoom out, we'll, we'll see that. You know, maybe one way to think about this is that if I gave you this graph, you can reconstruct this formula and know where all the ands are because it's just putting ands between the things encoded by the edges, right? So it's completely lossless. So somewhere in here, there's enough information to reconstruct recover the ands. Okay, and in here then, uh, okay, so if, if, I, if I chose an assignment uh, of, uh, of variables, if I set like true and false, right, I can imagine uh, plugging this in. So this would be like a true, this would be false, uh, this would be true, and this would, oh, sorry. That would be false because x2 is set to false, and x2 bar would be true, right? And if I find an edge of the form true to false, that should give me a clause that's violated, right? Because this edge is saying, if you set x1 to be true, then x2 has to be true, but you set it to false. And indeed, you have x1 bar or x2. Okay. Um, yeah, so here's one for, for the other example I gave, which is just omitting one of the clauses, it's a little smaller now because it only has three clauses. Yeah. Yeah, so some level, yeah, we haven't done an algorithm yet. We're still just doing modeling. And certainly if I just like guessed everything, that's no better than before. Yeah, so we haven't, yeah, that's coming up. Okay, so here's two graphs. This is a formula that we can't satisfy. This is a formula that we can satisfy. Now we want to come up with a smarter algorithm than guessing everything, right? And what's the point of all this graph stuff? So maybe we can try to study this graph and see what's the difference. 
Yeah. A cycle. Uh, in the first graph, yeah, the first graph has cycles. Um, yes. The second graph has cycles too, though. This is a cycle. Yeah, what's the difference between these two graphs? Yeah. Uh, okay, it's true that this cycle is very small, and this one has a cycle of length four. Uh, I think I could have made an example with longer cycles here. It's just that there's only four things, and so that's that's more an artifact of the example. Yeah. Ah, okay. So this one has a cycle. So for example, if I go here, then here, then here, then here, I have a cycle that has x1 and x1 bar. That says, oh, if you set x1 to be true, then something, 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 and you have to set x1 to be false. So a cycle where that contains both x1 and x1 bar is a is a red flag that this is going to be impossible right because implications are going to contradict themselves and at least coincidentally so far that is not true here it's kind of correlated with the fact that the cycle is small but the although there are cycles in the satisfiable formula there's not a cycle containing both x1 and x1 bar and there's not a cycle containing both x2 and x2 bar the cycle in this example is connecting x1 bar and x2. And another cycle is con connecting x1 and x2 bar. So there's not a direct implication of that sense encoded in the graph. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, any ideas for an algorithm? Yeah. Yeah, let's see if we can make an algorithm out of this. So take a formula, build this implication graph, compute the strongly connected components, and if for some variable xi, xi and xi bar in the same connected component, they're strongly connected, there's a cycle, will I answer false? Otherwise, will I answer true? So we have to prove that works. Clearly false means false, that one's okay. It's not clearly obvious that if there is no nothing in the same strongly connected component, you can eventually extract out an assignment. Okay, so so we'll try to do that. In fact, maybe I can then ask. Okay, so what would maybe so if it's if it is satisfiable, maybe we would like to output a satisfying assignment. So first step is you compute the strongly connected components. Okay, and let's say that you don't have any variables that are in the same. Uh, where both uh, xi and xi bar are in the same strongly connected component. Now let's try to output an assignment. What's a what's a way to try to generate an assignment? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can try taking the first SCC, and then we can just try, oh, here's a source, let's try setting it to be true. And then, I don't know, rip it out and move on to the next SCC or something like this. Yeah, um, or set it to be true, and that now sends a lot of other things to be true and stuff like this. Is that gonna create any issues? Yeah, okay, so we're gonna try to do something like that, but one has to, go about it a little bit carefully to show that you won't reach some situation. It's not obvious like, oh, what happens after the first component and some contradiction might arise or something, right? So that's what we're gonna to try to show. And that's what we will show. Okay, right, okay, so 
we're looking out for these cycles. Okay, so algorithmically, that's what we're going to try to do. Okay, we want to show that whether or not uh, a literal and its opposite are in strongly connected component is a determining factor. Uh, the easy direction, as we've already noted, if they are in the same connected component, it's definitely impossible. So the interesting direction is if they're not in the same strongly connected component for any literal, for any variable, let's come up with an assignment. OK, so if we look at the strongly connected component of the implication graph, all literals have to have the same assignment. Okay. So you can either set all of them to be true, or you can actually set all of them to be false. And that won't be an issue. But definitely if you set it to be true, then you can't have a mix. Either all are true or all are false. Okay. Now, OK, another interesting thing is that we always have these complementary arcs. So if I have an arc from x1 to not x2, from the clause not x1, not x2, then you always have the opposite clause from saying, oh, if I set x2 to be true, then x1 has to be false. So this, this graph actually has a funny structure, this sort of complementary structure, where for every arc, there's sort of an opposite arc from the opposite literals. Okay, so that's, that's going to be important. Uh, right. So I don't know. This is sort of abusing notation. But basically, for every strongly connected component, you always have some strongly connect, another strongly connected component in the graph, which I'll denote C bar, but kind of represents the opposite, where all the literals are opposite and the arcs have been reversed. Okay. Uh, negated literals and, and reversed, reversed edges. OK, so. Good. That seems to be the same slide. OK, so now with those observations in hand, let's, uh, let's, try, to, let's try to accomplish this. So OK, suppose that uh, we, well, before we focused on source components, but you can just as well focus on sync components. Suppose I have a sync component C. The claim is that the complement is a source component. Why? I mean, by complement, I mean that opposite component. Yeah, this is coming from that complementarity thing. So. If this was not a source and there were other edges like this, then from the opposite, you must have something like this. Right? So, okay, so this thing, uh, this is very nice, right? That even, even the kind of topology is like reversed in some sense. Okay. All right, so let's try an algorithm that sort of, you know, identifies some sink and its opposite source. Right? And certainly if I set this to be true, then this has to be false. And if I set this to be false, then this has to be true because they're opposites. Right? Yeah. Yes. 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 Every strongly connected component always has this complementary strongly connected component. Yeah. So that's all inside the squiggles. Okay. But let's try this algorithm that's kind of dealing with one component at a time from outside moving in, right? So take this sync component. You can either assign it true or you can assign a false. What should we do and why? Huh? It does matter. Yeah. <laughs> I have this source. Should I assign it true or should I assign it false? All right, I'll force you. Who's not going to vote? 
Wow, okay, let's see who's left. Who wants to assign this true? And who wants to assign this false? Okay, why did you want to assign a false and not true? Oh, okay, well, okay, so one thing is that this might not reach this. So although the scribble might suggest it, it's quite possible that this can't reach this. So it's not immediately a contradiction that by setting this to be true, that forces this to be true and that's a problem. However, there's still some intuition. How come, so if I had set this to be true, then that has untold consequences of setting other things to be true. Right? And likewise, if I set this to be false, actually in the reverse direction, that forces other things to be false, right? Because this can't be true because I would force this to be true. So one of these choices has consequences. One of these choices doesn't. If I set to this to be false and I set this to be true, it doesn't imply anything for anything in the middle. So I can set this to be false, I can set this to be true, and not worry about anything, right? And then I can rip those out and do the same thing. If this one had variables x1, x2, and x3, this one also has variables x1, x2, and x3 in some negated form, right? So I'm only handling some of the variables. There's no like cross interference there. So it's safe. Maybe you could assign this true, but you could definitely assign this false and get away with it. Yeah. The, the cycles are inside C because we've taken the strongly connected components. Yeah, so now what's left is a DAG, where inside a DAG there's all these kind of equivalent literals. Yeah, yeah, so, so an edge from one component to another means that there's some edge in some vertex here to some edge in some vertex here, which means that if I set any variable in this component, which is not drawn, to be true, that'll force this variable in particular to be true, which will force that variable in particular to be true. So the whole clause has to be true. So the implication graph still works at the component level. Yeah. <coughs> So that, that's the algorithm. Um, thought there's more here, oh, right? So I'll set this to be true, set this to be false, and then I can just remove these and recurse. There'll be a new source and a new sync. I'll figure those out. And they're gonna have no problem with assignments from here to here because setting this to be false didn't imply anything. And saying this to be true didn't imply anything. Good. So, so that's uh, that's the whole algorithm. Pretty cool. Okay. Uh, what's the running time? I feel like that that text makes it seem more complicated than it is. Uh, what would be the running time of our algorithm? Why? Hmm? M plus N. So here there's M clauses and N variables. But uh, for every clause, I made two edges. Right? And for every variable, I made two vertices. So our graph had 2M plus 2N. Right? And uh, this step took OM plus N. And uh, this step, just checking, will also just take O M plus N, you know, you're just reading everything over once. That's pretty easy. And then now you just have to go through these things in order. And so that'll be very quick too. Okay, so everything is just linear time. Yeah. Yeah, so in here, Maybe there's different variables like x1 and x2 bar. So when I say I set everything in C to be true, 
That's going to be mean I'm going to set x1 to be true. And I'm going to set x2 bar to be true, which is to say I'm going to set x2 to be false. We'll have the same value. And then, and then, yeah, just to reiterate, that means that x1 bar will be in here and x2 will be in here in this example. And so when you set everything to be false, you'll be saying x1 bar to be false, which is setting x1 to be true, which will agree with setting this whole clause to be true. So things will work out nicely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you didn't, you know, focus on things like strongly connected components and stuff, you start at x1. Uh, first, you have to figure out if you want to set it to be true or false. And if, you, if you're just doing something where you guess both, you're going to end up doing brute force. That's no good. So you, how are you going to conclude that x1 should be true or x1 should be false? That's tricky. And in fact, X1 in our algorithm might be somewhere in the middle. It may be a bit confusing at the, opera, at the very beginning to know what X1 should be. These are kind of obvious. These are kind of obvious. Things inside here won't be obvious till later. So also the order in which you address the variables is not clear unless you, from what I can tell, unless you take the strongly connected components. Yeah. There's only one vertex for literal. And each vertex is only in one of the strongly connected components. Um, OK, so this will take m plus n time. This is a very clever, clever algorithm. Uh, but in hindsight, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, so, so next time, we'll look at this problem. All right, so now we can do 2 sat. We can't do 3 sat. What about max 2 sat? Right. So that's what we're going to try to figure out next time. I will ask for another vote, and and we'll we'll deal with max two sat on Monday. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let me remind us what we did Friday and, and get us uh, caught up as a few more people trickle in. So we started discussing 2sat and max 2sat. This is continuing an even earlier lecture where we started talking about sat. Uh, again, the big question is, is there a polynomial time algorithm for, for satisfying Boolean formulas? And uh, we already showed the equivalence to 3sat weeks ago. And uh, so we started looking now, what happens if you go from three to two? So we're looking at these formulas, a conjunctive normal form with only two variables in every clause. And besides two sat, where you're trying to satisfy all the clauses, you're also max two sat, where you're not necessarily trying to satisfy all the clauses, just as many as possible. Okay, it's a little bit more like an optimization algorithm. And we had a poll. Uh, not as many people last week. Um, but uh, yeah, and we pointed out, okay, this might be a little bit backwards because actually if you could solve max 2 sat, you could solve 2 sat. Not necessarily vice versa. We'll see what happens. And so we discussed 2 sat. And it turns out you can get an algorithm for 2sat. And, and somehow it's because these clauses with two variables, you know, it's like very limited degrees of freedom. So if I have A or B, I know that if I don't choose A, I have to choose B. If I don't choose B, then I have to choose A and things like this. So this actually turns out to be quite strong. And you can start building graphs out of this. Okay. And so that's two different examples. And then ultimately, we gave an algorithm that would uh, basically look at the, the strongly connected components uh, 
of the graph of this quote unquote implication graph, which had other nice properties like this sort of like opposite thing going on, this complementarity. Um, but as a result, you can actually just compute the strongly connected components and just kind of rip off source and sync components and, and choose the conservative assignment to all those literals. Okay. So we actually got a linear time algorithm. Here, M is the number of clauses, N is the number of variables. Uh, or maybe M is the total size, I don't know. Oh, no, it's two set. Okay, M is the number of clauses uh, to solve a two set formula. I mean, either decide it's solvable or not solvable. And then if it is, compute a good assignment. Okay, so on to the next question, max two set. Okay, is there a polynomial time algorithm for this one? And uh, so I've set up another poll for us. Uh, so I've marked this with an X. Oh, well, I want to see if anyone revises their poll. Um, so we did find that there's a polynomial time algorithm for two set. And I'll remind you that most of you voted, uh, who did vote, I think it was like 14 and three or something like this. So more people thought this would be hard. Oh, no, 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 it was 14 to three. More people thought we'd get an algorithm here than we likely wouldn't. Okay, so I was going to reassess this. First of all, who's not voting? Okay. Just goes up over time. Okay, who thinks we can get an algorithm for max 2 set? Okay. And who thinks that it's going to turn out to be hard? Okay, it's actually quite close. And then yeah, the rest of you suck. Um, okay, but it's, it's pretty close. I mean, we have people who are equally passionate that it's gonna have an algorithm, or it's gonna be hard, but I really don't wanna vote. Uh, but more people thought it was gonna be hard this time. Among those who thought it was gonna be hard, anyone want to explain their thinking? What was your intuition? It doesn't have to be a right answer, it's just, Fun discussion. Yeah. Oh, so this is an algorithm. Try to find a lot. Sorry. Yeah. So what? Why did you think that max two sat might be as hard as regular sat? I mean, more people voted for it this time than last time, so some people changed their mind. Doesn't have to be a good reason. Last year, somebody said, well, I don't think you would do two polynomial time algorithms in a row. Maybe that's your reasoning, I don't know. Yeah, so you could say that at some level there's more degrees of freedom or at some level choices are kind of bad, right? It turns out here there was no choices to make. Everything kind of became forced. But choices are kind of dangerous. And it feels like here, you know, you can set some variable to be true or another variable to be true, or you can just give up on the clause. It does feel like you have like two and a half variables per clause in like a weird way because you're allowed to sort of just say, oh, I won't even satisfy this clause at all. So maybe you can degree argue that, okay, maybe it is combinatorially more complex because you have this additional option. I don't know. Okay. All right. That was fun. So let's, uh, what, what we're going to do is actually, I'm going to first focus on a, for technical reasons, I'll explain in a moment, a relaxation or a slightly modified problem. Uh, so this was technically saying there's exactly two variables for every clause. Now I'm going to say, what if there's at most two variables for every clause? They're very similar. If you can solve this, then you can immediately solve this, right? You can take your two sat formula and put it into here. There's still at most two variables per clause. Um, so this should be at least as hard, but we're going to find uh, it convenient that we can only use at most two variables. So here's what we're going to try to show. 
we're going to show that the slightly different problem with at most two variables per clause is probably going to be pretty hard. That a polynomial time algorithm for this problem will give you a polynomial time algorithm for general set. Okay. So, okay. All right, so how, 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 um, how do you set this thing up, right? So how would you try to set this up? How would you show that at most two sat, maximizing at most two sat is hard? Conceptually, what, the, what does one need to show? Maybe it's a little vague. So, you know, we could take as input some three sat instance, right? We know that three sat instance, if you can solve three sat, you can solve any Boolean formula. That we know from, from before. And what we'll need to do, right? So we're, we're asking how powerful would a black box for max less than equal two sat be? So somehow we need to take our three sat instance and turn it into another formula with at most two variables per clause. It could have more var uh, variables total and stuff like this. And then, you know, we will we'll presuppose, suppose you could solve this problem, right? And and you can give it an outmost two. It'll tell you how many can be satisfied, right? It'll give you some number, right? And if you can take this number and interpret it as a yes, no for the original problem, and it's all correct, then you'll have solved the original problem. Okay, it's just a, a diagram for a reduction, but... Right. So maybe one thing kind of interesting for us is that earlier, or usually when we do it at reduction, usually like the black box gives a yes, no, and then we just respond the same yes or no, or the black box gives a number and we just return the same number, like in some of those shortest walk problems and stuff like this. This one's a little bit different because here, this question is asking for a number. And up here, uh, we're asking for a yes, no. So we'll need to do a little bit of converting the number, interpreting the number as well. Okay, so let's do it. All right, so the high level or, you know, the, the clear challenge is we need to sensibly convert conjunctive normal form with three variables per clause to conjunctive normal form with at most two variables per clause, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if if I had a black box for max three, for three sat here and I started with max two sat up here then I will have shown, oh, so in this case, uh, okay, so first let me ask, so in general, when you have some kind of diagram like this, all this shows is that this problem should be at least as hard as this problem, because solving this would solve this. And if you switch to roles, it would show that the other problem solved. Now, in the case, I think you're saying that, oh, if 3SAC can solve any Boolean formula, does that give you some kind of circle already? So if you could show that, for example, this problem can be written down as satisfying a Boolean formula, then that would be fine. But this we have not yet done, although it's believable. You would think that if you can satisfy, uh, if you can solve the satisfiability problem for any Boolean formula, then maybe you can take this and figure out how to write a clever Boolean formula, but you would still need to be able to do this to ultimately make that argument. Absolutely. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. Yeah, and that's that's natural, right? I mean, reduction sounds like a funny name or fancy name, but that's like, uh, I don't know, how you use your Unix tools and how you use libraries from GitHub or something, right? Just we're using a black box to just solve your problem. Yeah. Uh, but what's what's kind of interesting is that then we get these 
you know, kind of negative results, right? We're saying, oh, then there probably isn't an actual black box here because that would be too good to be true. But still an understanding of algorithms. Yeah, so, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, I should mention, I have almost no idea what the word reduction means. Like, I never know if you reduce A to B, if that means A implies B or B implies, a. like, I get quite confused. So I often I just write it out slowly as algorithm for one implies an algorithm for another so that we're all on the same page. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, so again, uh, we, we, we want to kind of imagine we have a black box to solve max two set and we want to solve a three sat formula. So the first step is to take the three sat, turn it into two sat at most two variables per clause. Okay, so any ideas for how to sensibly do this? Yeah. Sure, yeah, maybe it's helpful just to focus on one clause. Okay, can I use like uh, the assignment trick that we sort of did previously? Okay, now there's a catch. So I think hopefully we have the assignment click in very small font up, up above. Mm. Okay. Ah, okay. So here's Z equals X or something, right? And that looks good. The only problem is that for us, if you're saying Z is equal to A or B, X really has two variables here. And if you plug this in, you'll find that you end up with actually three variables per clause. So if I want to write Z equals A or B and then expand that out, you'll actually end up with three variables per clause. Let's see if I have that as an example somewhere. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have the, the, the picture on hand. But, but actually, the assignment trick that we leveraged a couple of times ago will get stuck uh, because it actually generates three variables. If you want to do Z is equal to A or B per clause, it will generate a couple of clauses of three variables each. But that's a very good idea. Oops. Okay. There we are. I briefly flashed the answer, but I don't think you saw. Okay. Um, so the assignment trick doesn't quite work here. And in fact, if it did, then, then you might be able to turn the whole thing into two sat and use our algorithm from last class. Uh, it doesn't, okay, so the question is, I have an idea to change max two sat to three sat. Does that help? Uh, it doesn't directly help, but maybe it can inspire something. Oh, okay. All right, so one could maybe try to imagine how to go from max two sat to three sat uh, by introducing a variable that sort of uh, means you're going to satisfy this clause or not. And then maybe you can work through it. I kind of realized, okay, this is going to take a little time for me to think about how to do it, but that seems plausible. Uh, I'm not sure if that will help us. Maybe if you can kind of imagine reversing it or something. Okay, so this one this one's very hard to guess. I think this is more just a question to help us kind of appreciate what's coming up. So I'll just reveal it. So <laughs> what you're gonna do is you're gonna generate 10 clauses, 
Okay, and you might wonder, okay, how do you come up with this? I think you have to just think about it for a long time. We're just going to verify that it works. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to take this clause A or B or C. We'll create one new variable. We'll, I'm calling Y here. And then we'll create all these clauses, A by itself, B by itself, C by itself. I mean, I won't list all of them, but there's like many combinations here. You can see they all have at most two variables. And, right, right. And so, so A or B or C could be a literal, right? Like A could be X bar, X1 bar or something. In which case, A bar would just become X1. Okay. So, what we are going to take advantage of is the fact that we're doing a max problem. Okay. So, these 10 variables, we're going to fill out this table, should show that if if you have some a b and c that would have satisfied this clause a or b or c you should be able to satisfy more of these than you could have if a b and c were all false and the formula wasn't being satisfied maybe it would be helpful to go through an example so um right so i guess i've sort of uh okay so what I want to ultimately count is, like, if A, B, and C were false, 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 how many of the 10 do we get? How many of the 10 do we get? How many of the 10 do we get? Um, but I guess uh, I've broken up into rows, sort of, to help understand what's going on. So, so let's take the top left, right? So uh, if it was false, 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 out of the three singleton clauses, how many points do we get? Zero. Yeah, not, not a trick question. Okay. And then what about true, false, false? For the, we'll do one row at a time. If it was true, false, false, how many points would you get? Okay. True, true, false. True, true, true. Okay. All right, next part might require more thinking. Okay, so here's three clauses that are like all pairs of negations. Not A, not B, not B, not C, not C, not A. Okay, if it was false, 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 how many points would you get? Okay, if it was true, false, false, how many points would you get? Yes, that's true, okay. True, true, false, two. And true, true, true. Okay, so what we kind of want is we want the totals for these three columns, the last three columns to be higher than the first one. Because if you are actually assigning at least one of them to be true, you should be able to get more points is the idea. Right? Then when you're doing max less than equal to, you can get some separation. I mean, we'll see it play out, but that's the idea at this stage. Okay, let's look at the last row. So this is for a particular set of A, B, and C, your, your black box is going to try to choose the best Y to maximize the number of those last four clauses. Okay. All right, so this might take a little longer and that's okay. If it was false, 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 how many of the last four could you get? Three? Let's see if that's true. It's true, okay. So false, false, false will get six points. Okay. What if it was true, false, false? Three, two, I'll wait for a consensus to emerge. Two, yeah, so, so let's say A is true, B is false, C is false. And your max two set, you know, because we have this new variable we introduced, your black box is going to choose Y to try to satisfy as many of these as possible. These are the four clauses that include Y. So I heard two twice and three once. Anyone else? Three? Oh, now three is coming back into the four. Okay. Let's see. Who who likes two? Less people like, oh, still have one. And who who likes three? Okay, so most people are saying three. Let's see what happens. Okay, it is three. 
Okay, so this is kind of a good sign. If you actually were going to satisfy the formula, then you'll be able to get one more point. I mean, let me, I can reveal those last rows because they're just adding up. You would be able to get one more point than you could if you weren't truly going to satisfy this clause. Okay, um, what about true, true, false? Three. That add up to seven again. And then what about true, true, true? You can get all four. Okay. So we have this actually, we've, we've kind of managed to make some kind of gadget where I can take one clause into a collection of two set clauses. So that for any assignment, you know, A, B, C, if that was an actual satisfying assignment, you should be able to get seven points. If it wasn't a satisfying assignment, you can only get six. So, yeah. Yeah, obviously it's very clever, but you can at least verify that it works. Okay, so, so that, that I mean, this lemma is just uh, doing this kind of thing. If you take some three literals, then we can convert it into, you know, two literals and it'll be six to seven. Okay. All right, so how, how can I now use this gadget to complete that picture in the top right? Ultimately, I have a black box that can solve max at most two sat. I take as input a three sat formula. We have this trick. So I give you a three sat formula. You have a black box that can solve at most two sat, max at max less than equal two sat. What would you do first? Okay, we will apply this to every one of your three sat things. That'll give you a bunch of them, right? It'll create like 10 times as many clauses. You put it into your black box. It gives you an answer. And then we just have to interpret the answer. Okay. All right, so that's what we'll do. And we just have to kind of figure out, okay, what does this number the black box gives us means with respect to the original problem? Okay. So, okay. All right, so you, you have, let's say M clauses. I'll let M denote the number of input clauses. These are the with three variables each. For every clause, you'll create 10 new clauses as well as a new variable yi. And then you define this two sat form or less than equal two sat, which has your original variables plus the new auxiliary variables, one for each clause. And it'll just be a, like combining all of these in, in one big conjunction. Okay. Now, if f is satisfiable, then what will your black box return? Yeah, it's going to be able to, so, yeah, so if, if x1, xn is the satisfying assignment, right, then we know that we can choose the remaining ones optimally uh you know uh 7m are satisfied in g right this is coming from that that table so for every clause with three variables it's satisfied by the x's so i should be able to choose the corresponding y to get seven points and okay what if f is not satisfiable
So I'm gonna okay. So so that means there's some there's some clause CI that's not satisfied, right? So any YI gets at most six points. Okay, that's what we showed, and that was the first column of the table. So that implies that the max is at most 7m minus 1. You can't get a perfect score. A perfect score is 7m for us, the max number of points you can get. So 7m minus 1 uh, is the best you can do because at least one where you're going to lose one point. So ultimately, yeah, ultimately that completes the picture, right? So up here, you're asking, is this bigger than 7m or less than 7m? Okay. And so that's how you convert your number to a yes, no answer. OK. All right. So that is max 2 sat. So or at most 2 sat. So this turns out to be, to be um, hard. Yeah. What inspired this? Uh, I think in hindsight, this is still pretty clever. Um, what inspired this? Uh, Well, <laughs> one explanation I can give is this is the, not the last really clever reduction we'll see. Um, uh, I think this was recognized as clever when it came out. I don't think there's a perspective that makes this really obvious. I mean, you can see that, I mean, in hindsight, you can see how it works. So I can probably make the same observations you can. Um, I, my guess is actually the original ones are probably messier, and then over time they got it nice and clean. Um, and I don't know if you can do it, you know. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, you could like, I could imagine someone first doing the first row and that's for these first two rows and kind of building out a table like this and then being like, okay, we have a problem three, four, four, three, right? This is almost good, except I'm not distinguishing true, true, true from false, false, false. And then you can see like this choice of Y is sort of fixing this because if you got true, 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 then actually you can get all the points from Y. Um, yeah. Yeah, not clear. So so it's not easy to show that these problems are hard. These are surprising connections between problems. Yeah. And uh Yeah, and I, and I pick out the most exciting ones for class. Yeah. So um but yeah. We'll see. Maybe we'll, we'll look back um yeah. Uh okay, so in fact so keep in mind, we originally wanted to do max 2 sat. And actually, if I remember correctly, the original thing I was looking at uh, did max 2 sat in one shot to prove that. So we're going through this less than equal 2 sat. And, and I broke it up into two stages. So actually, uh, the original paper kind of collapsed. What we just saw was what we're going to do next. That makes it look even more complicated. Uh, if I remember correctly. But anyway, so our original question is, can you do 2 sat, max 2 sat uh, in polynomial time, given that we can do exact 2 sat in polynomial time? But we're going to show probably not. So now we just, we already now know that less than equal 2 sat maximizing this is pretty tough. And now all that's left is uh, uh, trying to sh convert it to a 2 sat formula. Okay. Hopefully this is going to be easier 
it should hopefully be easier to go from less than equal two sat to two sat compared to three sat down to two. Okay. So all we really need to do uh, is address the singleton clauses, right? So you have a less than equal two sat. You want to turn it into uh, exactly a two sat formula. So it's only the clauses with one variable that we need to worry about. So, uh, so I give you a clause that looks like uh, X, right? It's just X. How do I turn this into a two variable clause? Yeah. Oh no, you're not allowed to or it with itself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, two distinct variables per clause. Sorry? Uh, or was y, so I write x or, okay, so I start with just this clause and I introduce a new variable y. I'll call it yc just to remember. Like that's the one for that clause. Well, okay, so that means that that you know your formula f is going to go to some formula g with now uh, I guess a bunch of variables for the clauses y1 to ym if there's m clauses and I could make this true by just setting all the yi's to true Oh, like this, uh, or, or false, but this is not a, a clause. This is not a, uh, so, so if you expand out, okay. So assigning YC equal to zero is, is the same as, as writing not yc as its own clause, right? Um, but that has one variable. Yeah. Uh, so okay, so what's the intuition here? Oh, interesting. Okay. So if X is true, how many points can you get by choosing YC to your advantage? Two. So if X was true, I could set YC to false and get both of these. If X was false, how many points can you get? One, because this is false, this is false. You can only get one of the two. So you have that separation again. So that's the that's the intuition, right? Um, yeah. So we'll just introduce an auxiliary variable and just or it was y and not y. Okay. So that will take our uh, yeah. Okay. So one thing is that you need to convert numbers to numbers, right? So we take our formula f, we turn it to a formula g. And that'll give us some number of satisfied clauses in G. And I need to turn that into how many clauses you can satisfy in F. Okay. So we just need to do this calculation. So let's say that F had K singleton clauses. I mean, was one variable each. If our black box tells us, oh no. If X1 satisfies a P clause in F, like it satisfies 100 or something, then how many clauses will you satisfy in the new one? P plus K. So every single thing you get a free point. And in fact, this is an if and only if. So I'll put one more F here. FF stands for if and only if. 
If you get uh, P plus K, you know that you're double counting, you know, the, the singleton clauses. So you subtract that out. Okay, so, so all put together, one is equal to one plus the other in K. Okay, so that, that's how you map from one problem to the other. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's that. You'll just subtract K from the answer of your black box. And that's it. So, so, so we, we did two reductions pretty rapidly. We went from three sat. I, I, okay, I don't, we showed that less than equal two sat can solve three sat, uh, maxing. And then we showed that max two sat can solve maximizing less than equal two sat. You put those together. And now max two sat can solve three sat. Okay, so max two sat turns out to be hard, or you know, hard in the sense that it could potentially do a lot more than you would think. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions? Okay. So I'll start what we'll do next time and see how much uh, momentum.